good, good morning. Uh, sorry, we were just celebrating the, the, the church and I. It's the church's birthday. Um, today is Pentecost, the day that we celebrate the birth of the Christian church and the coming of the Holy Spirit. That, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm wearing red and, and there's red everywhere. My name is Mike Cassidy. I'm the pastor here at Faith United Methodist Church. It is my joy and my privilege and my honor to welcome us into worship on this Pentecost Sunday morning. I pray that you are well, that your spirit is, is light and ready to receive the Holy Spirit today on this day. As we begin worship together, I just want to share a couple of things um, to let you know what's happening in the life of the church. First off, um, tonight, that is May 31st, Pentecost Sunday, tonight at 7 p.m., we're going to all meet together, those that are able, drive to the church. It's a drive-in Pentecost celebration tonight. Bruce Wallen's going to be singing and playing guitar, leading us in the song from the safety of our cars. We'll hear um, some scripture, a prayer, a devotion, and just spend some time easing back into life and worship together. It will be so good to see one another this evening. And then, don't get confused, but beginning in June, which I know is tomorrow, but next Saturday, that's June 6th, we're going to hold a weekly drive-in worship experience at 7 p.m. in the back lot of the church. They'll be parking every other spot to maintain a six-foot distance outside so that we can put out lawn chairs in front of our cars or in the bed of our trucks. We also will have some spots designated six feet apart again for families if you'd like to park up top and bring your lawn chairs down into the grass and sit and share in worship together weekly, 7 p.m. on Saturday nights, and then we'll be filming parts of that to then use for our 10 a.m. streaming service Sunday morning um, on Facebook and YouTube. We're going to be doing both. We're not abandoning our online presence, but we are going to begin to add in some physical live worship experiences so we can once again begin to connect as the community of Christ as the body of Christ. I'm so thankful, though, that we can connect this way as we finish our sermon series on House Church, From Your House to My House to God's House. It's a joy to be with you today. Now we'd like to head to the Mumaw House, where Sarah Mumaw is going to open us in prayer. Sarah. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. O God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It is a joy to be with you and to celebrate. So at this time, we'd like to greet one another on this Pentecost Sunday morning. Here's what we're going to do in the in the comment section here on Facebook and on YouTube. What I want you guys to do is share with one another. Come Holy Spirit, come. Let us know you're here. Let one another know you're here and celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit together. I'll catch you back here in about 20 seconds. Holy Spirit, come. And speaking of Holy Spirit, we're going to welcome in the light of Christ as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Sarah, Muma, and Jeff are going to lead us in a call to worship. It's going to be on your screen. I encourage you to verbally, out loud, share in this liturgical moment. And then Kathy Sims and Sky Clements are going to lead us off in worship. Sarah's going to read some scripture. Gina Herman is going to share another song with us, and then we'll come back and say a prayer together in our pastoral prayer time with one another. Let us worship with one heart and with one mind.
Please join me in the call to worship on your screen. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. God's word. This is Psalm 104, verses 31 through 34 and 35b. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. Thousand reasons for my heart. 
pray. For God, oh, four thousand tongues to sing your praises unending. The ways that you have worked in our lives, the ways that you have filled us with hope in times of darkness, life in times of death, joy in times of sorrow. May you always be the rock upon which we build the foundations of our lives, for you alone, God, are unmoving, are firm when all else is sinking sand. Lord, may we bless you with our souls. May we give ourselves to you fully, in body and in spirit. And where there is darkness in our spirits, where there is anger and hurt, confusion and pain, Lord God, may you sow your grace in us, amongst us, through us. Lord God, as we continue on in this pandemic time, Lord, we pray for wise decisions. We pray for unclouded vision as we try to see a way forward always and ever following you and your spirit. We pray for those who are sick, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are suffering psychologically and physically from the isolation and unknown days that we have been through. Lord God, in this time, I pray especially for those places in our country that are experiencing civil unrest. Lord, in the wake of the death of George Floyd, in the wake of poor decisions, may we not compound those decisions with more poor decisions. May we step back. May we reevaluate who we are in light of what has happened, the ways in which all of us are complicit in the hurt, in the fear, in the prejudices that we live into, often unknowing, Lord God. May we see this world once again with your eyes. May we see ourselves, Lord God, scary though that may be some days, with your eyes. And for all those anywhere who suffer under the weight of oppression and inequality, Lord God, may your spirit and your son bring freedom, bring release for all of us anywhere who are complicit in oppression, suppression, in pushing others down that we might step up into the light, Lord God, the lime light, may we step back into your light. May we remember your son who came not to be served, but to serve. And may we serve one another in love, in charity, in equality, and in hope for a future where there is no pain, no hurt, no dying, no illness, no suffering, but where we all recognize one another as your children, where we all recognize you, Lord God, where we all feel your spirit alive within us, we all follow your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
אמן. אמן. It's been a hard week. Uh, a difficult time, hard to watch the news, to see the kind of people we, God's people, have become. The things we're capable of, the ways we forget one another's humanity, and in so doing, lose our own. And so what can we do but go to God and ask for forgiveness, ask that we might be healed body and soul. And so if you have a prayer, a hurt, a pain, a concern, or a joy in this time of darkness, please share it with our care team members, share it with our church. You can email admin at valleyfaith.church. Julia, our office administrator, collects those prayer concerns, shares the confidential concerns with our care team only. And there's also a prayer team. You can be a part of that team. Again, you can email Julia and she'll make sure that you get the weekly list of those in our community who are inviting each other to come in together in prayer. As we move now into this time of offering, I thank you all for the ways that you've given and shared and become a part of the Ministry of Faith United Methodist Church. If you'd like to give today, you can do so. There's a link to give online in the worship description information section. Also, you can give in mail and in our mailbox or by bringing it into the church. Thank you again. But I want to ask you to do something specifically today in this offering time. We're going to hear a song by Hillsong called New Wine. And I want you to use this time as a time to offer yourselves that God might fill you with new wine, that you might be changed. Offer yourself, your whole self, all of you, all that God has created.
Thank you, Lily. And now it's time for our kids' moment, as we do each and every Sunday and have been doing in this time. We're going to go to another one of our teachers in our congregation today. It's Dina Colson. She is a librarian at Lone Jack Elementary, and she has a message for all of us about the Holy Spirit and about Pentecost, this day, the birthday of our church. Dina. Hi, my name is Dina Colson, and I'm the librarian at Lone Jack Elementary School. Today's scripture comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 4. This says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. So today I brought with me some balloons. Have you ever been somewhere and you've seen someone who'll take these balloons and they twist and they turn them and they squeak and just when you think they're going to pop, they turn into an animal or a flower or sometimes even a sword. That's kind of fun. Then we have these kinds of balloons. Have you ever taken a round balloon and blown it up and then with you and a friend, you bat it in the air and see how long it, uh, you can keep it afloat before it touches the ground? Well, I know there's lots of fun to be had with balloons, but there's one thing missing in my balloon. That's right, it's the air. Okay. In order to be what this balloon is supposed to be, it has to have air. So to fulfill its purpose, someone must breathe some life into it. Well, today we're going to learn a little bit about a special day in the church. Today is called Pentecost. Pentecost is a day when God sent his Holy Spirit to breathe life into the church so it would be all that he intended it to be. Before the Holy Spirit, church was lifeless not witnessing and telling people about Jesus. <clears throat> but after the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit breathed life into the church and everyone started telling people all that they knew and everyone that they saw about Jesus. It didn't matter if they spoke the same language. Everyone they told about Jesus understood what they were saying, no matter what language they spoke. And that day, thousands of people were added to the church. The church became alive and doing things that God had commanded. Breathe life into your balloon. Just as a balloon needs to be filled to be what it was intended to be, you and I need the Holy Spirit to fill us so we can be all that God wants us to be. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit. We thank you for breathing life into the church. And we thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to all who believe in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye. Thank you, Dina. I believe I can speak for the whole country, if not the whole of creation, when I say that we could all stand to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this time, filled with the breath of God right about now. It's been a hard week for so many. It's, it's, it's been a hard year, and yes, I know that is an understatement. It's also gotten difficult for the early Christians as we continue their story in the book of Acts. Today marks the final week in our house church series, and I think it's fitting that we end this series on Pentecost, the day we celebrate the birthday of the church and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 tells the story of how the Spirit descended on the disciples in that upper room and gave them the power and the courage to burst out of their confinement and proclaim the good news in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, today we're in Acts chapter 8. And the gospel has now moved out of Jerusalem, out of Judea, and into Samaria. Now, Samaria, you might know, it's the ancient capital of the northern kingdom of Israel when 
the, ten, the 12 tribes separated, the 10 northern tribes became the kingdom of Israel, the two southern tribes became the kingdom of Judea, Judea, Benjamin was also part of that. The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom for hundreds of years were at odds, the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians, the southern kingdom to the Babylonians. And even after they continued this animosity, and so it was a big step for Jesus to share his message of, of hope and of healing and forgiveness with that Samaritan woman by the well. And so now it's a huge step for these early Christians to share that same message of hope and healing and forgiveness and now of resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit in Samaria. And in fact, it wasn't exactly a planned missionary endeavor into Samaria. We learned that in the early days after the death of Stephen, Paul and other radical Jewish leaders mounted an all-out assault on the early Christians. And they were scattered, the Christians, that were scattered across the land. The apostles alone stayed in Jerusalem to hold the base of this movement together. The rest of the world... The rest of the disciples were spread out in the known world, exiles, strangers in strange lands, fleeing persecution. They were scattered, divided, isolated, unable to meet together, unable to worship together. Sound familiar? But they were not alone. They had the Holy Spirit and God was doing something new. God did not allow this difficult and unprecedented moment in the early history of the Christian church to stifle the sharing of the gospel. Rather, the scattered disciples saw this time of hardship as an opportunity to preach Christ and Him crucified to new people in new lands, even in Samaria. And so in Acts chapter 8, Luke gives us one story of these scattered believers. It's the powerful story of Philip. He's another one of those deacons, if you remember the seven, who were commissioned to wait on tables, to work with food distribution for the widows in Jerusalem. Now Philip is in Samaria. He's preaching, he's healing, he's casting out evil spirits. He brings joy to the people of Samaria, hope. And, and many of these Samaritans are coming to Christ through Philip. They're seeking out baptism in the name of Jesus. And one of those who believed and was baptized is a man called Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer. He's a magician in the Greco-Roman sense. Like, don't think David Copperfield here. He's not out in Egypt making pyramids disappear. Rather, Simon was likely an adherent to some pagan religion or sect who professed to perform tricks and mysterious feats. And we learn that Simon was a man of some power and importance in his community. People even said that he had God-like powers. Simon was wealthy, he was influential, he was powerful, and so the fact that Philip had converted this pagan magician to Jesus was no small feat, and it likely went a long way toward spreading the gospel to others. In fact, Philip was having so much success in Samaria that the early apostles back in Jerusalem sent Peter and John out to investigate to see what Philip was up to, what fruits were coming from his gifts. Peter and John arrived. They find crowds of new believers, and they lay their hands upon them. And these believers receive the Holy Spirit, we read, just as the early Christians received the Spirit at Pentecost. And this is where things go a little sideways for our friend Simon Magus. You see, he slipped. He forgot the gospel he had received from Philip. He forgot the kingdom worldview where the meat shall inherit, and the last will be first, and the poor and the powerless are beloved of God. And when he saw the power and the beauty and the wonder of the Holy Spirit being poured about upon so many, unfortunately, Simon saw that moment with his pre-gospel eyes. 
He saw only the power and influence and importance to be gained in that moment. He saw the possibility of returning to the person of prominence he was before Philip and Christ entered his life and his community. And so he pulled out his wallet. This is Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. We read, Now, when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I may lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. But God, we do come to you humbly and in repentance, that for all those places where we, like Simon, the sorcerer, have gotten ourselves sideways, that we might be returned to you that we might return to wholeness through you. And so I pray, Lord God, that you might speak a word to each and every one of us who listens and watches this day, or any day, that we might hear you and see you in the words that we hear today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Simon was used to a world where his powers, his tricks and illusions gave him prominence. They made him important, and more than likely they made him rich, and that money just served to make him even more powerful. And while we have no reason to doubt Simon's conversion to Christ, we do see in Simon the same tendency that we experience ourselves, I think, today. Because you see, becoming a Christian and following Christ is not a one-and-done experience. We aren't baptized and then everything is smooth sailing after that. Yes, we are a new creation, but it doesn't mean that our old creatureliness is gone for good. It's, it's always there, lurking in the back, waiting for an opportunity to roar back into our lives. That's the power of sin and the power of Satan at work in this broken world world. That's the truth of living in a world that is broken with sin. You see, when we come to Christ, we might be changed, but that doesn't mean the world around us is changed or that it is done trying to change us back. As Christians, so often we're like Philip, aliens and exiles scattered in the Samarias of the world. Cultures, communities, and socioeconomic systems that are at odds with the gospel, preaching truth in the faces of powers and principalities that are threatened by the upside-down kingdom of Jesus Christ, where we're called to love our enemies, turn our swords into plowshares, give away all our money, serve our neighbors. We call Jesus our king, and that makes the kings and queens of this world more than a little nervous. It's hard to live a kingdom life of putting yourself second to God and neighbor in a culture where if you aren't willing to do anything to be first, you might just lose everything, including your life. It's hard to live into the beauty of the Garden of Eden when our cities and our stores and our police stations are burning like the fires of Gehenna. And so sometimes... As Christians, we find ourselves more like Simon Magus than Simon Peter. We forget ourselves. We forget who we are. We forget whose 
we are. We let our guard down and we slip back into old habits, comfortable routines, and the ways of the world. Instead of allowing ourselves to be moved by the Spirit, we try to buy the Spirit. I mean, there was Simon Magus. He'd witnessed signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. He'd seen demons cast out. He'd seen the lame walk again. He heard the good news, and he'd been baptized into new life. I mean, in Acts verse 8, verse 13, we read this, that even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. He was amazed. I mean, that's what we hope happens when we bring anyone to Christ. That That's what I want my life to be. Staying constantly with other Christians who are more mature than me. Living a life in constant amazement at the signs and wonders that God is doing in this world. But then when Simon sees Peter and John laying their hands on the crowds of Samaritans, men and women that he was baptized with, with Philip, and, and men and women with whom he shared the waters of baptism, when he saw them receive the Holy Spirit and the, the joy and hope, comfort and peace, power and beauty that the Spirit brings to all of us. I mean, did Simon think, I can't wait to receive that same Spirit? I can't wait to be filled with the breath of God. Did he think, I want God to fill me and move me and use me? Did he ask to be filled with this new wine? No. No. He fell back to Satan's temptations of power and control and worldly success and influence. He fell back to a world ruled by money, not by the Spirit. And instead of asking for God's Spirit to invade his life, he asked to buy the power to give the Spirit to others, as if he could buy God's gifts, as if he could control the Holy Spirit, and by controlling the Holy Spirit, that he could control others. Control. Once again, it comes back to control. It's so hard to let go of control. I mean, we just moved into our new house last week. We've been renting these first three years in Grand Valley. And one reason for buying our own home is that now we're able to control what we do with it. We can paint it the colors we want to paint. We can fix it when and the way we want to fix it. We don't have to wait for someone else to decide how and when something should be done. We know how much it's going to cost us every month for a month for the next 30 years. We don't have to worry about the uncertainty of how much is rent going to go up this year. When we bought our house, we bought control. Because letting go of control is scary. And for all of our love of Jesus and our awe, and awe at the foot of God the Father, Allowing the Holy Spirit to work with us in, within us in mysterious and unforeseeable, powerful ways? Man, that's scary. And no wonder Simon thought, if I can only buy the Spirit like I might buy a house, I can control it. I can take ownership over the Spirit and not let it own me. That was 2,000 years ago. In today's world, in 20th century capitalist, consumer, corporate America, we can own a lot of things. We can own just about everything. I mean, a whole billion dollar industry has exploded over the past decade, dedicated to storing the things we obsessively buy and own and control. There are 2.3 billion square feet of self-storage space in America, and it's been growing by 7.7% every year since 2012. 2.3 billion square feet of containers, containment, and control. 
We can buy a lot of things in America and we've got space to contain it. I mean, we even have stores that sell nothing but containers, big box containers that sell smaller containers so that we can buy and contain and control everything about our lives. But you know what you can't buy? Love. I mean, just ask John, Paul, George, and Ringo. It's free. And because it's free, love cannot be contained. It cannot be controlled. And sometimes love is dangerous, and sometimes it messes up our lives, and sometimes it changes who we are or who we thought we'd be. And you know what else you can't buy? The Holy Spirit. We just ask Simon Magus. He learned that the hard way. Give me also this power, he said, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. And pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chain of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. The Holy Spirit cannot be bought. The Holy Spirit cannot be contained. The Holy Spirit cannot be controlled and the Holy Spirit cannot be owned. In fact, if anything, you, me, we, all of us, all of creation needs to take a step back, let go, and let the Holy Spirit own us. We all of us need to get owned by the Holy Spirit. We need to be moved and shaken and tossed about a bit. We need to make space for the unpredictable, uncontainable, unimaginable power and beauty, wonder and joy of the Spirit. We need to stop holding on to things and the life and the luxuries and the familiarities and the comforts of this life and let the Holy Spirit blow us into the kingdom life. I mean, in this time of uncertainty, and unknowns and change at every corner. It's so tempting to, to lean in, to grab hold and exercise more control, or to force things back to the way they were so that we might own them and contain them even if just for a moment. I think that's what happened down at Lake of the Ozarks this week. I mean, I don't imagine anyone went down there intent on flaunting the rules and the safeguards and the lives of their neighbors. I'd like to imagine that people went there to escape, to forget a bit in a safe and contained environment. But then you get there and it, it feels comfortable and it feels familiar. And it feels good and, and it feels possible once again to take back control from the uncomfortable, unfamiliar, unknowns of this COVID world. And the next thing you know as you try to control the world around you, ironically, things around you get out of control. And people get sick. Needlessly. A police officer in Minneapolis, takes an oath to protect and serve, to work for the good of his neighbors. But this urge for power to control and contain is too strong for him. And the next thing you know, he's literally standing on the back of someone in a position of weakness, and his knee is on George Floyd's neck, and he's in control of everything now, even another man's ability to breathe, and things get out of control, and George Floyd dies needlessly. Controlled and contained, the spirit dies. The breath of God and George Floyd is snuffed out. 
tragic and horrible consequences from our incessant need to own the world and the people around us. But what if we were to let the Holy Spirit own us? What if we were to let ourselves get owned by the Holy Spirit? What if we were to give up control, allow ourselves to be moved and changed and filled with the Holy Spirit? Acts 8 tells us of the great joy and, and, and excitement that came to Samaria with the coming of the gospel and of the Spirit. And if you've watched the news at all lately, you know there's anything but joy in the world today. Pain and hurt, anger, confusion, and death. The world burns, and not with the fires of the Holy Spirit. So what if we give ourselves over to the movement of the Spirit? Come, Holy Spirit, come. What if we give ourselves over to the things God would do in our lives, in our congregation, in our communities? Come, Lord Jesus. What if instead of, of buying and owning and building more and more storage containers and closets and third, fourth, and fifth garages to contain all the things we try to control, what if we remember that God made us to be the containers? That we are to be the vessels for the Holy Spirit, for new wine and new life to be poured out through us onto the world. That broken though we may be, we are vessels meant to contain within us a spark of divine. And though we might contain the Spirit in these jars of clay, we will never control the Spirit. Not for all the money in the world. Rather, we are to be so moved by the Holy Spirit that the world around us is in turn moved by the Spirit through us. That we and the world might be moved to new possibilities and not more limits. That we and the world might be moved to new freedoms and not more barriers. That we and the world might be moved to new life and not more death. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, make us a vessel. Make us an offering unto the world of your Spirit and of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, just as the disciples were contained and confined in that room 2,000 years ago and your spirit blew through and blew up the world with love and life and resurrection, may you blow today. And though Simon Magus tried to control and buy and contain the spirit, he could not do it. And the spirit blew up in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so today, in this life of containment and confinement and isolation and sheltering in place, as we begin to crawl out from our rocks, as the world begins to open up, may the Holy Spirit blow up our world and our hearts for you. And Lord God, even as there's unrest in the streets, as the containment, the confinement, the control of George Floyd led to his death, might you yet blow things wide open out of that confinement and containment. May your spirit blow things wide open. That there might be life where there was death, where there might be hope where there was hopelessness. That we might see a future united where there was division. 
that new wine might be poured out on this earth. That we might live again, wholly and fully in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gina's going to join us now. We're going to sing a song, another hill song, a song called Broken Vessels. We are all broken. But it is through the graciousness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we might become vessels for new life, love, hope, peace, joy. And above all life. Amen. I do pray that I see, see with these eyes in person some of you tonight, May 31st at 7 p.m. here as we have our drive-in Pentecost worship experience outside. And then remember next Saturday night at 7 p.m., that's Saturday night, June 6th at 7 p.m., we'll be gathering for an evening of worship. And then every Sunday, at 10 a.m. online on YouTube and Facebook. I'm going to end um, by way of a benediction with an adaptation of a 19th century poem, A Prayer to the Holy Spirit, by Christina Rossetti. She's a beautiful poet. Some of our Christmas hymns come from her poems, like A Bleak Midwinter. But this is a prayer to the Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit, who is light unto your children, may you enlighten us. O Holy Spirit, who gives never-ending grace, may you replenish us. O Holy Spirit, who is the fire of love, may you burn in our hearts. O Holy Spirit, who is Lord and giver of life, may you live within us. 
as a cloud lessening our temptations, as the dew reviving our weariness, as fire purging the waste in our hearts, as water purifying our spirits, as the wind sending us out, as a dove turning our eyes to heaven. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go as vessels filled with new wine. Amen.